Uh, let's begin. John Redden is a man of many words. In addition to being international head of watches, Christie's, you may have heard of them. He writes, for Patek Philippe magazine, several books on the history of watchmaking and Forbes. So, if you want to be featured on the list, John is your man. Straight out of Die Bundesrepublik, Christine Hutter did it the German way, approaching her watch career with surgical invasiveness from skeleton outwards. Moritz Grossmann, thanks to her, is able to surpass reliving glory days through nostalgia and actually live them. Whoever said Italians were only made for food, shoes, and winemaking didn't realize you needed a watch to keep track of all that. <laughs> the director of Bulgari Watches Design Center, Fabrizio Buonamassa, reinterpreted the language of Bulgari to a dialect we can all appreciate. Beauty uncompromising of quality. The perpetual swing that keeps the hourglass forever flipping is Michael Tay. His forward thinking has had the effect of ensuring the sands of time keep in his favor, which is admir admirable since usually the race with time is against us. As the group managing director of the hourglass, let's welcome the hourglass that flips, flips itself. Roger Smith has already had his intro, so... <laughs> I won't be so bold as to assume he needs another one unless he wishes to do one himself. Um, well, yes, um, thank you. <laughs> uh, uh, Roger Smith, a uh, watchmaker based on the Isle of Man, making a very few wristwatches. Okay, short and sweet. <laughs> An award winning journalist and author of A Grand Complication, amongst other publications, Stacey Perman's opinion is garnered by the likes of Time Magazine, Business Week, Barron's, Fortune. Forbes, Wall Street Journal, The New York Times, Financial Times, and Hollywood Reporter. She may float like a second hand sweeping smoothly across a dial, <laughs> but she stings like a perpetual calendar <laughs> that demands razor-like precision to reset, lest you wish to suffer the consequences. <laughs> That was hands down the best introduction we've had. Dominique, well done. It's a lot to live up to. It is such an honor to be on the stage with, with all of you. Uh, I have been looking forward to this moment for this conversation for a long time. And uh, to begin, uh, welcome on behalf of Christie's and Dubai Watch Week uh, to, this, to this forum. We are going to dive deep as much as we can in 90 minutes into the, the world of, of Genta and, and Daniels. And, and ultimately, the, the takeaway for everyone in this room and for all of our online viewers is how these two men live on. It was 2011 that they both passed away. And amazingly, seven years ago, and it feels, it feels like yesterday. But they all live on in, in our watches, in our hearts, in our minds, for those that, uh, that, that knew both men. And we're going to discuss today their, their legacy and what, they've, what they left behind. And with the esteemed panel here, we are going to be able to look at their lives from in very different ways. Um, some of us on, on the stage you know, knew one of, the, one of the gentlemen or the other gentlemen. Some of us had the chance to meet both. And, and we're going to talk about some personal stories. And in the audience, I know there's a number of people that knew both, both men, too. So I look forward to the Q&A. Um, and I hopefully, hopefully you can share some of your stories, too. So, uh, so to kick off, I, I just... I'm going to have to go to you, Roger, first. Uh, because you mentioned yesterday during the panel how you were 16 years old and were inspired by Dr. Daniels. And I'd love to hear the story of how you connected with him and how it all began for you. So, um, yes, yeah, so, so my first meeting with George was, uh, I, think, I think it was about 17, 17, at a college in Manchester where I was studying horology. And uh, we heard that this man called George Daniels was going to be visiting the workshop and meeting the students and talking about his work. And um, I was told that he made watches by hand. And obviously, as a cocky young student, I realized 
that making watches by hand was completely impossible and um, didn't believe it until the following day when George walked through the door and I thought, well, here is a man who probably will make a watch by hand. And I asked what was on the end of his pocket watch chain and out came the space traveller. And that, for me, was a turning point in my life, really. Um, that evening, he um, delivered a lecture to the students and he talked about the, the years and years of dedication that he'd put into making these handmade watches where he'd design everything from the hands, the dial, the case, and then drilling back into the mechanism and making every single component in the mechanism with exception to the balance spring and possibly some jewels. And, um, you know, this story, I remember just hearing these stories and the tales of his various sort of challenges of trying to conquer the Swiss watch industry, you know, just left me, you, I don't know if you've ever had this sort of cold shiver where you realise you've, you've met greatness. And that was, that was it for me. I never looked back. Incredible. And how many years did you work with him? I worked with him um, in, in his workshop uh, about three and a half years. Okay. And then we, um, I basically went to work with him on the Millennium Project which was using the um, very first mechanisms off the Amiga production line which housed his escapement and then we built a watch around that mechanism um, and then when that finished he had a rest obviously he was uh, you know an elderly man by that stage I got cracking with my own work and then we joined forces again in about 2009-2010 with the idea of building a, a new range of watches you know, completely in-house, um, which was the Daniel's anniversary watch. And we're still completing that series of watches, series of 35 pieces. So that work with George is, in some respects, it's coming to a close, but we're very close now. But it's living on. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. Yep. Later, I'm going to ask you a question about what your, your days were like during that three and a half years. But we're going to come back to that in, in, a, in a moment. I'd like to, to move on to, to Christine. And you knew of George Daniels. I don't I understand you did you never met him. I never met him. But how did his um, his life and work inspire you in um, reigniting your brand? I think we are we are more inspired uh, from uh, Moritz Grossman from the heritage of Moritz Grossman, but it's similar to George Daniel because uh, as uh, Roger said before, he did he did a lot of um, craftsmanship and work in, in the movements and also if you look to the new developments like his escapements and that's the same way because Crossman he wrote a book in 1880 it was the title has been the construction of a simple but mechanical perfect watch and that's a little bit our philosophy and I think it's similar to George Daniel's uh, philosophy because we also look we have very classical watches from outside it looks very simple and easy, but uh, inside, if you go into technical construction, like we created the twist, a new winding mechanism, we put hair into a movement to stop our tourbillon. Then we, we created the pusher system, which is really between winding and setting time. So we really try to go on in a, in a, in a special way, and that's similar, I think, what George Daniel has done. Also, we. We produce our hands by our own, so cases no, we do only the technical construction and design, but here we are working with a case maker, but uh, from the movement really we produce to 85, 90% in-house and the hands, and it's already a lot for manufacturing, I think so. It's, it's inspiring to hear this because without a doubt, Dr. Daniels was one of the greatest watchmakers of all time, many yeah. say. Yeah, of the last so. 200, 250 years. And we're also going to be talking about Genta, who many say is the greatest wristwatch designer of time. Yes. He's definitely the most it prolific. And, um, and we're going to bounce back talking about uh, both uh, uh, Daniels and Genta. And, and I'd like to uh, ask Michael, because you're, you're one of the, the people on the panel that knew Gerald Genta uh, personally. Uh, can you tell us how you, what it was like when you met him the first time? What was your first impression of him as a man, and what's your impression of his work as a designer? Um, the first time I met uh, Gerald Genta was at his wedding to Evelyn Genta. Really? Um, <laughs> and I think apart from the proceedings, which was 
an incredibly grand affair in uh, uh, in Monaco. Um, I didn't, you know, it, he he didn't leave an impression, um, but the event itself left an impression on me. And it wasn't really only till uh, uh, later on when I first started working in the watch industry. Um, my first job was uh, in Gel Genta. Mm -hmm. um, and at that point in time, the Hourglass had uh, acquired uh, uh, ownership of Gerald Genta. Um, you know, Gerald was an artist, more than a watch designer. And, you know, he was somebody who was consumed with his art. Uh, he painted every day. Um, and I think that's what motivated him. And I think this is where it's, it's uh, you know, he, he, he has had such a distinctive flavor because he didn't train as um, a designer, as a classical designer. Um, he trained as a jeweler, as a, a goldsmith. He was able to um, look at um, objects in a very different manner. Um, so not as, uh, not as a, a classical designer per se. Um, and I think this combination of um, uh, the tactility of being a jeweler and a craftsman um, with uh, the temperament and the, uh, for the lack of a better uh, description, the ego of an artist, um, you know, helped him view <coughs> watches really as a, uh, or the watch as an object, as a medium for him to express himself. Um, he was an individual who, uh, you know, he spoke some English, but he refused to speak English with me. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I remember conversations with him where it was a real struggle uh, to convey my ideas and for him to uh, insist on uh, 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 expressing himself in such a manner. Um, but I think that, that stubbornness and that, uh, you know, that confidence in what he wanted uh, to, uh, you know, how he wanted to approach his work, um, his profession, his career in his, on his own terms, um, fed through to his, to his designs. What you said about ego is interesting. Yeah. Because it's a, it's a compliment. It is. And for some yes. people it's not. No. But in this case it is. And, yes. and I think um, both George Daniels and Gerald Genta were very confident individuals in what they did. And we could all, we could all respect that. Um, so we're going we're to circle back to that in a moment uh, as we dive deeper into their, their personalities. And uh, how, the wedding was memorable. It was memorable. There, you uh, have to have a story to tell <laughs> exactly. that you've never shared publicly before. <laughs> <Is that? laughs> well, you know, I think the, 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 the point about um, uh, uh, well, ego, their, uh, um, he was more Picasso than he was um, a Van Gogh, for example. Yes. Right. And I think his larger-than-life character um, resulted in, you know, grand expressions of his work. And I think it really lent to his ability to, to think differently, to design differently. And that's a perfect segue to my question for Fabrizio. You're the one designer on the stage today. So you live and breathe, and you're always thinking differently and, and challenging uh, norms from the past. Now, with that in mind, how has Gerald Genta informed and challenged your work uh, at Bulgari? Uh, it's, uh, I'm a designer. I'm not just a, a watch designer. I think it's important to, to get inspiration from a lot of different uh, areas. So uh, when I started my career in Bulgari in 2001, the acquisition was uh, 2000. Yeah, 2000. Uh, so uh, it's... Uh, inspire me for sure because Genta makes a lot of uh, impressive watches and I'm really <coughs> surprised when I listen to you he's more an artist than a designer because he introduced uh, during his career a lot of innovation small innovation in terms of design so it's um, I never met him um, if you love watches for sure you have to be inspired by some products that Gerald Genta designs I'll try to do my best to, to respect and at the same time to make a step ahead this kind of heritage, this kind of legacy, even before, even because I work for, for Bulgari that holds Gerald Gent and Daniel Roth. So it's, uh, it's, even, uh, it's even more difficult because it, I have to manage the heritage of two different brands in one product. And uh, when we decided to go ahead with the Octo in 2001, we decided to revamp 
this, this brand, and for sure one of the most iconic signature of Gerald Gente is the octagonal shape. But for me, it's not the most uh, iconic one, because they say that uh, Gerald Genta, that's why it was surprising, because it's, uh, it's an approach uh, in terms of products uh, very, very uh, come from the design point of view. He changed the way to wear a watch. So he makes this beautiful uh, bezel, these beautiful cases, this beautiful bracelet, but he changed the way to wear a sport watch. Before Gerald Genta, you have the sport watches, and after Gerald Genta, you have a different perception about sport watches. And the most important things for me was not the octagonal shape for the bezel, but was the link between the bracelet and the case. Because before Genta, you have the case with the lugs and the bracelet. And after Genta, you have just one shape. So you have a lot of different story behind the octagonal shape with the eight, uh, eight screws that comes out from the, from the Geneva leaks. It comes out from the, from the, from the ship, from, from Great Britain ship. So uh, for me, it's uh, just uh, a shape. The most important things is the link because it changed completely the design of the, of the sport watches. And today we talk about sport watches and a certain price with certain materials and a certain way to wear it thanks to Gerald Genta. So uh, for me it's an inspiration, for me it's an opportunity to go ahead and to develop this kind of work in a, in a different way. But he play with materials in a very unconventional way for the Jeffica, for the bronze, for the first time. The story behind the Jeffica was very interesting. So it's a, it's a full of story behind, behind the products. And for me, this is, a, this is an opportunity to get inspirations. When you are redesigning or improving an icon, how, did, how does that feel as a designer? Is so, it, do you feel a responsibility? Yes, sure. A great responsibility. And how, how's because the challenge? Because often when you play with iconic products, 99% uh, you can make mistakes. Because it, if it's an iconic product, it means that it's almost perfect. So if you make a redesign, if you have to work with this kind of ingredients, uh, often you can make uh, mistakes. So it's a great responsibility. I think that my job is play with constraints and play with the science. So I have to play with the octagonal shape. I have to play with a different way to wear a grand complication watches. I have to respect the Gerald Genta legacy. I have to respect the Bulgari heritage. And when you are able to combine together these kind of things, uh, could be that you make a, a good product. But just the market can tell you if you are talking about an iconic product or not. Because for me, all the watches are my baby, so all the watches are, <laughs> are great <laughs> and good design. But just the market, after years, can tell you if we are talking about an iconic piece or not. Interestingly, many of these designs in response to the Quartz Revolution, uh, we could really talk a yeah. lot about Agenta and Daniels in the 1970s. This is a question for, for Stacy, wearing your, your cutting edge <laughs> historian uh, hat. When these, when these masterworks came out from, from Genta and Daniels in the 1970s, they were, some would say they weren't clear cut hits uh, initially, especially from a design side uh, with, with Genta. And for Daniels people, not everyone understood um, they didn't ignite the watch world as they, they do today, but were Genta and Daniels ahead of their time? And as a historian, where's their place in history? Well, I think they were definitely ahead of their time because, as you said, they, they, both of their designs and, and, and in the case of Genta and Daniels' watches uh, were not, you know, and, and embraced immediately. And I think um, if, you, if you look through, you know, history in, across industries, across academic fields, there are always individuals that are ahead of their time. You know, there was Galileo, obviously he wasn't a hit right away. Uh, even Steve Jobs um, invented the Newton, which was a precursor of the tablet, which everyone considers an unmitigated failure. And, um, you know, to, to Fabrizio's point, um, Genta's designs were, were very different. He integrated the bracelet to the case. He used it stainless steel it was, it was not just priced like gold, but, but it was treated like gold, and he had aspects that were considered hidden before, like the screws, and he brought those out. Um, and and it, it took some time. Um, to, to, to Daniel's, um, I mean, he, he's, he's talked about how he made prototypes with Rolex and, and Patek, and they turned him away. And while he's closely associated with Omega, I think, what, it took 20 years before that, they embraced the coaxial escapement. 
so when I think of ahead of their time, I, I would say yes. But I, when I was thinking about these two men, I was thinking of this, this conversation I had with this Japanese monk several years ago. So he was this 13th generation monk. Um, his father spent his life rebuilding the temple that the US bombers destroyed in the war. And he was spending his life um, putting the artwork back in the temple. And he commissioned this American painter to paint the ceiling after seeing her work in a gallery. And it was a very maverick choice because she was not Japanese, she was a Buddhist, and uh, she was a woman. And when I spoke to them, he refused any prototypes or sketches beforehand. He said, just do it. And she said, what if you hate it? And he said, everything looks strange for 400 years, and then it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> so my takeaway from this is that, you know, often innovators that are ahead of their time don't, aren't respected or um, embraced upon execution or even during their lifetimes. But if there is that talent and there's that singular vision, it will rise at some point. Better in their lifetime would be nice, but not always the case. And that, that's what I think about when I think of these two men. And I think along those lines, seven years after their, their passing, we, we look back, it's a history now, these, these two men transcended reality. And, and almost everything they did was, was brilliant. Mm -hmm. But uh, like, Roger, you saw the challenges at the time. You saw the success. You saw saw the failure. So, so two questions: Can you um, can you comment what was it like going through the day to day struggles uh, of working with Dr. Daniels? And uh, and then I'll have a follow up after that. Okay. So. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean it was uh, it, well, is is a fascinating sort of world to enter. You know, um, I remember turning up on. Is the it's ingrained in my brain? I think 90, uh, 2nd of January 1998, walked into the workshop and there was George tidying up a lathe, and I suddenly realised here I was, was walking into this man's domain. Nobody else had ever been in that workshop or worked in that workshop, and um, here I was, hopefully with expectations to learn a lot from him, and I did. And it was, it was an incredible period, and um, I often describe it as the sort of finest finishing school ever. For many, many years I'd been trawling through his book watchmaking and struggling and trying to, you know, follow how he built his watches and then suddenly to have the man demonstrating these skills in front of me was was an incredible sort of period. So was he patient? Well, I mean, yeah, surprisingly he was. Yeah. He was um I don't think many people thought I'd last longer than a couple of weeks, actually. <laughs> uh, because he had a, a ferocious reputation. And, uh, I mean, I can explain more about that, my thinking behind that later. But um, I think what he perhaps saw in me was somebody who wanted to learn. And as long as I was continually wanting to learn, he was happy to give as much information as possible. I remember one day, I, uh, we were making these Millennium watches. Initially, I was only going to be there with him for a year, and we were going to make perhaps nine to ten watches. And then a few weeks later, we had 50 orders. And so that whole process extend, um, extended. So I set about making 50 sets of hands, so minutes hand, hour hand, seconds, and a calendar hand, all sawn out with a piercing saw out of a sheet of gold. And the hour hand wasn't too bad. The minute hand was a bit easier, but the seconds hand was very long, very slender, and was bending and twisting and I couldn't get the finishing right and I kept thinking should I ask him should I ask him you know there's this sort of <laughs> nervousness in you know this doubt you know I shouldn't know what I'm doing but obviously I didn't and um, anyway I just said George I'm having terrible trouble with his hand and passed him the second hand and he um, I don't know if anybody has seen photographs of him he had huge hands they were like shovels <laughs> and um, <laughs> suddenly these hands just sort of softened and you know almost like a, a ballerina and you know just picked up the hand slipped it into a pin vise put it onto the rest and he just started f almost caressing the gold away from this hand and he just talked as he was working on the hand and it's just an incredible experience and uh, yeah very very clear thinking person i mean crystal clear you know, he never wasted a word on anything. And that's similar to his book, if ever you read his book, is, is just to the point. And uh, yeah, it's a wonderful experience. 
Regarding his, I'll put in quotes, ferocious reputation, does he deserve that as someone who knew him so well? Well, I think, um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you know. choosing my, yeah. Um, if George saw something in you, if he respected you, brilliant. He would be the most generous, kind-hearted person you could ever wish to meet. And, um, but I saw him with people and he was very short, very direct, bloody rude at times. And I could see why possibly he was like that, because he was somebody who'd knocked on George's door and demanded George's attention, and George was incredibly busy. He had things to do, and he didn't have a moment to waste. Every single minute of George's day was busy doing something constructive. And so if somebody turned up who wasn't, you know, on his wavelength... I mean, you've got to remember this man absorbs himself into watches for... I don't know, sort of 30, 40 years, to a level that nobody else had ever achieved and very few people have ever achieved since. And, you know, they talk about this 10,000 hours, you know, to, became brilliant, to become brilliant at something. It's gone way beyond that. And I think this is perhaps why he couldn't tolerate anyone who wasn't prepared to at least meet him halfway. And, uh, I've heard... Well, their first-hand accounts, their uh, videos that were, were taken of his life about his childhood. Yes. And the stories of his childhood are, are quite unforgettable. I'm thinking of the loaf of bread with his mother yes. or the exploding clock with his father. <laughs> yes. um, would you care to share any of these stories or others? Um, oh, about his childhood. Um, yes, I mean, well, yes, the clock. The clock, he had this, uh, the clock, which, the family alarm clock. Quite a the poor family here in London. And um, the father was an alcoholic carpenter or joiner and uh, spent a lot of his time in the pub. And um, this clock was the only means of getting the father up for work in the morning. Anyway, George had this overwhelming drive to strip this clock down and have a look at it <laughs> and uh, just to see how it works. And so um, he started to take this clock to, to bits and started to learn and become more and more fascinated by what was unfolding in front of him. And then he suddenly had the awful realisation that his father would be coming home and this clock ought to be back up in position, ready for, for the morning. And so, again, the build, rebuilding of the clock and putting back together and he got it back together. I mean, and again, that just shows the brilliance of the guy. You know, he had an innate understanding of all things mechanical. And obviously, under pressure, he could work and operate as well. So, um, yeah, that was one of the stories. And from what I understand, Genta had similar challenges early on in, in his career. He was churning out thousands of designs for five francs each. Uh, Michael, can you, can you comment on, on what you know uh, about uh, Mr. Genta's early career and, well, and think... what he designed and what he did at that point? You know, I think the, uh, there have been reports that he's churned out at least 100,000 watch designs, but I think that really goes back to the point that he is an artist first and foremost. Mm -hmm. um, because if you're an artist, you, you know, unless you release um, your creativity, um, it would be impossible to carry on living. And I think he was such an individual, um, and that's why he was so prolific. Um, not all of it was great, um, but I, you know, the anecdote that I can share is something which, uh, uh, which, which I experienced personally, uh, was that he was as proud of having designed um, Timex watches as he was with the more important iconic watches that he had uh, uh, produced, um, the Nautilus, the Royal Oak. Um, and I think that, you know, that demonstrates his conviction of the ability to commercialize um, uh, his designs, right? He is one designer has probably sold more watches for watch brands than any other designer in this industry, <laughs> yes. right? And you're talking today in the tens of billions um, of Swiss francs in value. Um, so he's created tremendous value for, for, for many brands and for uh, uh, many businesses. Um, the, he's, you know, his designs have touched hundreds of thousands of individuals. Um, 
So I think, you know, his ability to uh, transcend value per se, uh, specific commercial value per se, I think is, is one of his uh, uh, most defining uh, traits as a designer. Um, th th there is another uh, anecdote that Evelyn Genta shared with me uh, quite recently um, when we were speaking about uh, uh, Gerald and his uh, uh, past. Um, and that was, you know, how he introduced the Disney uh, collection <laughs> into Genta. Um, and it, it was at a, you know, before SIHH, there was a Geneva salon that I think all the, uh, the major Geneva brands, uh, Geneva based brands exhibited, so Vashon, and Paddocks. Um, and that particular year, you know, everybody was expecting him to do yet another great introduction of a great complication. And, uh, you know, he decided to do something very different. Um, you know, and because of his artistic nature, I guess he wanted, you know, he had a certain uh, 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 sense of lightness in his approach. And that's when, you know, he showed up, he went straight to the showcases after everybody had set up, you know, he made a grand entry, all the brands had already set up, and he started displaying these Disney watches, right? Uh, Mickey Mouse, the Minnie Mouse, um, as a way to provoke the industry and provoke the seriousness and the, the conservative nature of the, uh, of the watch industry at that point in time. Um, so such is his nature that, you know, he, I think for him, design was uh, just a matter of expressing his conviction in himself, right? He didn't really care much for the commercial realities of the marketplace. Um, he did what he did, and it just so happened that many of his designs became extremely successful. It's interesting. I'll bring that to Fabrizio. I, I think it's a very unique blend because it's a, a designer and an artist at the same time. I saw a, a lot of painting made by Gerald Genta, but when you see which kind of approach he has in terms of shapes and forms uh, and way to play with materials, it's more close to the industry than the artistic approach. I think for a designer it's very important to have a lot of ideas, to, have, to be very prolific, to make a lot of different things. And at the same time, I think that Genta respect uh, the brand. He, had, he was lucky even because he was the right man in the right place at the right moment. And he had the chance, uh, and lucky because he played with uh, a lot of huge brands. So as a designer, I'll tell you that I have a lot of ideas, but if I'm alone, Often uh, it's, uh, it's a beautiful sketch, I can make a beautiful rendering, a beautiful <laughs> maquette, but if I don't have behind me a huge brand that won't invest uh, in my ideas, uh, the story uh, becomes different. Uh, for sure it's a matter of ego because you have to be the first, you have to trust in your idea because otherwise it's impossible to sell it. You spend all your day or your night to think about objects that doesn't exist that have to be your expression. And you have to be able to respect the brand. If you have an idea for a certain brand, I have to start to study the brand. And I discuss a lot with these kind of things, even for uh, the, the students at university. You have to know very well uh, your playground. If you want to propose a watch or a product for a brand, you have to know very well the brand because if you don't know it, it's impossible to make an evolution of this kind of science. So, Genta, I think, uh, I discover, honestly, I discover a new, a new Genta, because I was, uh, I was convinced that it was just a, a watch designer. I saw he makes a lot of paintings. We have the Genta archive uh, in, uh, in, in, our, in our office in Hochatel, but it's true in a very artistic, uh, artistic approach. Often he has a very artistic approach. But I think it's very important to play with the right, uh, with the right brands in the right moment. That's why it becomes very important, very, very famous, because during those period, the 70s, it changed completely the shape uh, and the way to wear a watch, even thanks to, to the brands. Yes. So I think it's a, it's a really important point of view. I think he really sort of, uh, 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 you know, his, um, you know, his approach under his under Gel Genta. Yes, it's transformed a, dramatically. It's a Gel Genta approach yes. because if you see Royal Oak and you see Jeffica, yes. you see that the Jeffica you have a lot of decorative elements. Yes. When you see the Royal Oak, it's, it's yeah. absolutely you know, it's a, it's completely different style. Yes. 
but maybe you see Gerald Genta in both uh, products because he play with brass, with, uh, with the bronze, and we play with the steel in two different ways, but each, it's, each time it's the same, it's the same designer yes. or artist. Yes. And, and Genta clearly designed for himself first. It was, it was very internal rather than designing yeah. for others. And Christine, like, you're involved with design, of course, with, with your watches. I mean, or do you design, as an independent, designing watches for the, that you love and then hope the market jumps on it? Or are you designing watches for, for your patrons? How do you look at it? I think we, we do both. As we started with our Benio, it was a little bit of design. It was my first impression I had in my mind how we could do it. And uh, now, <coughs> If you, if you have a, a collection and you, you have the entrance in the different markets, then you need a look, what's the demand of the market? What would you, they like to get? And then you start, you know, we developed like a, a lady piece with a designer from Singapore, with Michael Koh, and he came up with an idea and I thought it's, it's great. It's uh, what uh, the industry is missing a little bit. A lady piece with a completely asymmetric case, only two lakhs asymmetric bezel, the sizes are different, and we put a high mechanical movement inside, and then we create a special dial for this, really a jewelry piece, but uh, not full with diamonds, spe something special. And it was uh, really a good experience because as we introduced the timepiece, I saw really, okay, it's Singapore will be the market, and then we will see. <laughs> and at least it was everybody worldwide, they said it's, it's fantastic. And then we went one step forward uh, with uh, the Digi family, Machers, yeah. Here and we said, okay, we have to develop this piece also for not only for Middle East, but special there. And we changed some parts in the design, and uh, we did it together. So it's retailer and we designed together in the background the designer. And uh, I think this year with the 1001 night, it's really a, a very special piece. And as we introduced the watch, so everybody, we got orders from everywhere. And that's fantastic. If you mean you do a product for the market and it's, it's your spirit, and at least you can cover the whole world market. So it's also time it's a, a little bit different because you, you have with our Beno 37, it was a request from uh, Japan. So they told us, please do the classical Beno, but in a smaller size. And then you have to follow this way. You have to listen and then to think about. And what I try often, I travel a lot. So I really try to talk with all retailers because if we only produce what I have in my mind, it's a... Uh, it can be good, but it must not be good. But uh, if you listen what the retailer would like to have, then it's the right way. And uh, we focus also more on personalizing, customizing. So we do special editions, like last year we have done the Extreme Dubai One. That was a fantastic piece, and we are working at the moment on uh, Extreme Dubai Two. And Again, a very, very a special piece, and I think nobody has done it before, what we try to do. And yeah, it's, it, it's, for us it's fantastic. We are independent, so we can quickly make decisions, and we are flexible, and we can really listen into the markets. And Thank also you. to end customers. A question for the panel is, what would uh, George Daniels and Gerald Genta think of the market today? I, I open that up to everyone. Pardon me? What would uh, George Daniels yes. uh, think of the market today? And what would Gerald Genta think of the market today in terms of design? Would they be happy with it? Horrified or a mixture of both? <laughs> That's a dangerous question. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. I, th I mean, speaking personally, I think um, George Daniels would have been very proud, very pleased with what's happening. You know, Amiga are now using the coaxial escapements. Um, we've continued with the coaxial escapements. Um, here in Britain, Charles Frodsham have just recently 
launched their new watch with um, George's double wheel escapement and you know his enthusiasm for improving the mechanical timekeeper is out there and you know it's been taken on by a major brand and smaller players here in Britain so yeah I think I think um, you know he would have wanted to be in here and part of that do you think uh, well you, you will know did uh, Dr. Daniels ever meet Gerald Genta I, I'm not sure I really don't so know does, does anyone I, know I mean I could imagine he would have done mm -hmm. but for sure I don't know and, and, and the follow-up, Stacey, this one's for you. If you had a time machine and George Daniels was sitting next to you, leave the next best thing, but, and, <laughs> and Gerald Genta was sitting next to you, what would you want to ask? What's the common question you'd want to ask them? And then let them have it out. <laughs> they were sitting together? Yes, if they're sitting right here, what would you ask them? Gosh, um... Well, they were such I iconoclasts, and I got the sense that they, you know, didn't have a lot of sacred cows. Um, I guess maybe the chicken and the egg question, is it, is it the technology or the design? I mean, I, I think George would have respected what Gerald Genta was doing and vice versa. You know, they both knew their own areas inside out. They're both geniuses in their field, and I think... George, without a doubt, would have recognised that, and I didn't, never met Gerald Genter, but these clever people, you know, <laughs> yeah, I think they respected each other's areas. Or maybe ask them to collaborate. Maybe that would would you That'd collaborate? That'd be quite the watch. <laughs> yeah. 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 A new born, a new brand watch. is born. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. I tried that once in 1999. Tell us. Um, I I tried to convince Gerald Genter and Daniel Roth to collaborate on a project. Oh. Um, oh. I think Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> I think Daniel was very open mm -hmm. and uh, uh, was extremely interested in pursuing that idea. Um, I think uh, Gerald was, uh, uh, you know, he, was, he politely declined, um, citing artistic differences. Yeah. Interesting. Creative differences. Different approach. Different approach. Yes. Different approach. Watchmaster and the artistic approach. Yeah. So yeah. often this is even my role because I'm yeah. Italian, but I live in Switzerland. <laughs> Bulgar is, a, is an Italian brand that makes beautiful pieces uh, thanks to our manufacturer inside. And it's uh, often uh, it's, this is the balance that you have to find because I make some sketches and the first reaction is it's impossible to do. But now we have this kind of watches that at the beginning was impossible to do. So uh, it's, uh, the design, it's... Uh, it's a matter of compromise, uh, for sure. It's, uh, it's not just the one person that makes sketch and everybody has to follow. In some occasion, you have some designer like this, but in other occasion, it's uh, often it's a team that have to produce uh, an object. So with, for some designer, it's not so easy to change some corner or to change some uh, radius on the sketches. For others, it's, uh, it's a matter of compromise. You can do it. But uh, this is the... This is the, the, the challenge. So often watchmasters and designers uh, speak a lot but different languages <laughs> but in certain moment you find a way to, to find a solution. Which is also interesting because you know with Gel Genta, uh, I think Gel Genta's uh, uh, namesake, um, his, the success of Gel Genta in the 80s and the 90s was really predicated on the fact that the, he was supported by a great constructor. Yeah. Right, uh, Pierre Michel Gaulet, um, who uh, was able to realize many of his very, very ambitious um, uh, uh, watches that he wanted to design and create. But I think he developed a lot of watches for different companies with his own brand. Yes, as well. Because, for example, yeah. I discussed about this with Gianni Bulgari about the story about uh, behind oh, the Bulgari know. Bulgari watch, and. Um, he told me, Fabrizio, the, the brand was uh, really impressive, the power of the brand. So uh, I designed this watch with the history of this logo, and after I called immediately Mr. Genta to develop the watch. Because we use a lot, Gerald Genta, those this time, to develop our ideas. And for example, the iconic dial with the 12 and 6 at very thin indexes, it was for the Bulgari Bulgari. I think this was uh, the, the, the suggestion for Mr. Genta. And he used the same design even for his own, uh, his own watches. 
Uh, the bracelet, for example, was designed after the Bulgari Bulgari case and the bracelet because at the beginning it was with the leather strap, was designed by us in our design team in Rome. But I think the Bulgari Bulgari is a combination between two uh, great minds, is Gianni Bulgari and Gerald Genta. I don't know who designed the case, who designed the dial. The story of Gianni Bulgari told me this was the idea and Gerald Genta developed the, the product, developed the prototype, developed the first cases and developed the watch. But the idea to put the logo with this uh, uh, portion of cylinder, very flat but thick, with this uh, inscription on the bezel, I think comes from the Bulgari, from Gianni, Gianni Bulgari. Bulgari. It's interesting, um, going back to 2009, there was a, a, a writer um, who some may know in the room named Konstantin Stikas uh, from, from Greece. And he called on the phone both Gerald Genta and he called George Daniels in 2009 and did interviews with each of them. And there's six page interviews with each of these men uh, before they passed away in 2011. I, uh, I read these interviews and I'm just going to share a couple quotes and then we could talk about it to the panel. Because uh, this, this well, first is the, the voice of, of Gerald Genta. And it comes to, along to that point with the Bulgari Bulgari. There's always, there's different sides to the story and sometimes the yes. truth is in between. And uh, I'd like to, uh, near and dear to my heart, the, the initial development of Nautilus is quite interesting to me. So, so these are uh, Gerald Genta's words, his, his version of the story. He said, it was a watch I designed during the Basel trade fair. I was at a restaurant of a hotel and some people from Paddock were sitting in one corner. And I was sitting alone in the other. I told the waiter, bring me a piece of paper and a pencil. Um, I want to design something for them. And he designed the Nautilus while observing the people uh, from Paddock eating their dinner in five minutes. It very quickly met with success. Um, I made the prototype in its uh, studio, and, uh, and the rest is, is history. He also added later in that interview, which is shocking to me because I never heard this as, as a Paddock historian, he initially designed the Nautilus only for women, which is quite interesting because look at it today. So um, any, any thoughts, any versions of that story you might have heard differently? It's, it's part of the myth. Yeah. So it's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so these, two, these two masters are still alive through the products, through the movement, mm -hmm. through the watches. It's part of the myth. So different story, different angles, but we have the product. So it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's the same with the, with the ellipse. You hear different stories from the history of it, and it's, uh, it's, quite, it's quite fun. The, in the same interview, they, uh, uh, Constantine went on and said, what, sh what, wear do you, what watch do you wear on your wrist? And he says, um, I'll make this clear. I don't like watches. <laughs> um, and, and then he's like, but, but I don't understand. He's like, he said, I am an artist. I'm a painter. I hate to adhere to the constraints of time. It irritates me. For those of you that knew uh, Genta, I mean, or, those are his words. This is what, my what's... answer after one week in Basel. Uh, in Basel, it's, <laughs> it's exactly the same. <laughs> one week in the booth. Is, Do you love watches now, please? <laughs> I want to change. <laughs> but uh, it's it's fine. It's uh, it's interesting. He, he was also he was a visionary. He talked about material, something that uh, that everyone here has has worked with. Um, he talks about how you brought up the bronze Jeffica, how he wanted to try uh, different materials. Um, he said, when, when one creates highly valuable watch, its price does not depend on the yes. material. We could use platinum or aluminum, makes no difference. And that is ahead of its time, considering what we've seen independence do. Um, would, you, would you like to comment on that, Roger? Use of materials that you've seen in time? Um, very, probably very difficult for me to comment on that, because I use fairly traditional exactly. materials. <laughs> but uh, no, I mean, I can see his point, and you know, it's, it's a different way of expressing yourself, isn't it? And, um, that's what an artist needs, colour and so on. So We're waiting for a titanium watch, right? <laughs> <laughs> Rubber case series two. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and uh, do you remember he, he was being called in 2009, because you were, you were with George at that time? Um, um, yes, indirectly, so. yes. Yes, I was on it, yes. Because in this interview, he talked about you. And I'd like to read his words. Oh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. He said, I should like to mention the, uh, a young man. Let's stop there now. Okay. I think. <laughs> yeah, that's good. I'd like to mention that a young man who is my assistant stood out as brilliant. He's now very established here on the Isle of Man. 
in his workshop. And between him and his workshop and me and my workshop, we're the only place in the world where you can, where you can buy a totally handmade watch. And then the interviewer asks, uh, Constantine asks, what is this man's name? He said, Roger Smith. And he's now practicing making watches here. And if you want a completely handmade, individually designed watch, in the full front of all technology, you must come to the Isle of Man where they are made. I'm just curious, like emotionally, does that resonate mm. with you from that time period? Yep. And what do you think the Isle of Man meant to him? It was his, I mean, it was the center of watchmaking for his world and your world. Um, yeah, yeah, it was. Um, yeah, let's pass on that. <laughs> He also, um, in the same interview, this is my last quote, um, and then we're going to open up to questions to the audience. Um, Constantine asked him, which complication for you is most difficult uh, to produce? And he quickly he pivoted and talked about escapements. He's like, I stick to my work with escapements. I don't have time for anything else. He's like, I'm too old now, so I'm happy with my escapements. And I think that really just captures the core of what Dr. Daniels mm believed in. Mm. Um, with that, I'd like to, I, we have, and looking around the room, there's so many people that knew both of these individuals, uh, had, had personal stories to share. I, I'd like to, um, to pass the mic around and, and please ask questions to the panel or share stories along the themes that we've been discussing today uh, to honor uh, these two gentlemen. Uh, so I'd, I'd like to open up to the audience at, the, at this time. <laughs> okay, so I guess this um, goes more to Fabrizio than anybody else. When uh, Audemars were looking to perhaps build on the success of the Royal Oak, uh, they gave a design uh, mandate to a very young designer called Emmanuel Gait, or Gait, I can't quite remember how to pronounce his surname, uh, for the Royal Oak Offshore. Uh, at the time, the rumors were that uh, Genta was less than happy, to put it mildly, with the design that deconstructed what he thought was ideal in its first instance. And yet today, with uh, Audemars celebrating 25 years of that said design with the future of first, is it true? Is it just a case of a matter of time before uh, something becomes iconic and classic or accepted again? I think at the beginning of the Royal Oak, the sales was very bad because it was, uh, was a brand new way to, to, to wear a watch. Honestly, I don't know because I don't know the story. I, the story that I have is Gerald Genta designed a watch in, uh, in one night because the CEO of the Mapige called him, I need a watch for tomorrow because we have, we have to present a new products and they, they make these sketches. Um, it's difficult to, to say, but at the beginning, when you want to break the rules, you have to take your risk. Often uh, you love your products, often you don't love it. It's part of the game, but you have to be, you have to be able to imagine uh, you, have, you, you need to have, you must have a vision. So I think this is the most important thing. It's difficult to answer to your question because I don't know, we discussed before, we have a lot of history behind. I don't know if Genta loves the Royal Oak or, or not, honestly. It's, uh, but but I, I think it's, uh, it's something that breaks the rules at the beginning when you see something strange, uh, the first reaction is, what is this? Imagine that when, when we make watches, now we are working on product for the next three, four years. And when we make watches, when we make the sketches at the beginning, if you say, oh, okay, now it's fine, it's good, maybe in the next four years it's something that has become old. So the Royal Oak break the rules, and maybe at the beginning it was very, was very hard to sell it, but honestly, I don't know if Genta loves the watch or, or not. Maybe Michael knows the story better than me. Um, no. Yeah. Oh, sorry. No, it's about it the offshore. The, sorry. Yeah. It was the offshore um, that Genta was less than happy with. Uh, yeah, 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 sure. I totally agree with he, you. He thought because that, if uh, you design the Royal Oak very thin with this kind of approach, when you make a watch big like this, maybe as a designer, the idea is that you destroyed my, my thoughts. Yes. 
because it was very thin, was very refined for a certain point, but this was an opportunity, and the brand have to catch the opportunity, I think. It's, uh, you sell your idea, and that's it. So it's, but, but, it's now, part but, but now the offshore is iconic. Now, it's now the shore is iconic, but I think that's my point. It's my taste. Uh, the Royal Oak, the Jumbo, is more iconic than the, the offshore. And I, th I think if you look at Genta's work um, from that period, uh, the, the height of the cases um, didn't exceed 9, 10 millimeters yeah. tops. Um, and I think, you know, if, if one were to consider the, even under Gerald Genta, the, the, um, the largest watch that he made, um, uh, that he designed for Gerald Genta uh, under his namesake brand, uh, was the Grand and Petit Sonnery. Right, and that was kind of a Mayan-looking uh, uh, structure of a case, um, right? And I, that that was the 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 the, the most maximum uh, uh, case size that he had ever gotten, or, or in terms of height. Um, so I think he respected elegance. He respected proportion. He was a classical um, uh, uh, um, artist, uh, classical gentleman, to begin with. So I think when it, it, it could have been possible, I never had a chat with him about it, but it could have been possible that, you know, it did, uh, you know, when you tried to re redesign an icon, um, and, you know, you were not asked to redesign but, that but icon. But I think uh, the Jumbo, it's different from the offshore. Uh, so it's, uh, it's yeah. not to redesign an icon, to try to introduce a new watch with the same, uh, with the same design for a different client. It's different purpose, different way to use it. So it's, uh, I think it, it works. But if I have to imagine an iconic product, I imagine the Jumbo, not the, not the Offshore. But this is because I'm a designer. If I make a shape after the brand start to imagine the evolution of this shape to make uh, more uh, opportunity. But at the beginning, uh, the original design, for me, it's uh, still uh, the iconic one. Thanks. Um most of what we've been talking, what we've been talking about so far, is Genta as a designer. But we've missed the fact that he was, at the time, one of the he made, he was making some of the most complicated watches in the world. And I'd like some of you to talk about his watchmaking abilities, particularly. Um, and one of the things that I particularly despise him for was that he introduced the dumbest complication in the world, which is the retrograde hour and minute hand, which, you know, a watch is a machine for telling the time, and it makes it almost impossible to tell the time with a damn thing. So I'd like somebody's viewpoint on those. I look at you. I look at you. I'm a designer, I'm not watch master, so it's a, it's a different... Um, honest, uh, honestly, I don't know. I think it's, uh, that's we get uh, gentle rod from uh, this gentleman because we need the skills to develop watches. I think that Genta makes beautiful design. I think that Genta was helped with the watch masters. Uh, maybe in his mind he has the idea to develop the Grand Complication watches in a certain way. And thanks to the, to the, the, the people who worked with him, he was able to do it. With, uh, again, a unique combination with amazing skills and a vision in terms of creativity. But, James, it's difficult to say, to, again, I cannot give you an answer because I don't know the story in deep. Uh, so. But when we get Daniel Roth and Gerald Genta, we find an amazing, amazing skills. Well, I think that, that, that's basically it, right? I mean, he, uh, I had mentioned earlier, um, uh, the, the man who realized his design dreams was Pierre-Michel Gaulet who was, at that point in time, you know, uh, the foremost, one of the world's foremost constructors. Um, you know, at, and coming off the back of uh, the quartz crisis, um, there were very, very few uh, watchmaking or ma watch manufacturers who had in-house capabilities in designing and developing grand complications. Uh, Gento was one of the five that existed uh, that was able to, uh, to execute on that. Um, you know, the... So he wasn't a watchmaker per se, but he knew how to utilize and work with the best uh, engineers, constructors to yes. realize his dreams. Um, the, the jumping hour retrograde minute, I think is a very novel way of telling time. Um, and till today it exists within the, the Bulgari collection. So I think that's, you know, that's proof and testament that people do enjoy that, uh, that complication. 
It's interesting to think historically how both um, Daniels and Genta and how they thought of form follows function. Yes. Yeah. Uh, at least my personal opinion is Dr. Daniels and form followed function. Mm. Mm. I'd like to hear your comment on that. But then with, with Genta, he didn't care. No. I mean, it was just about the design, how it looks. Um, but, but first, uh, with, with Daniels, did form follow function? Um, form follow function. Um, do, do, let me see. With designs of movements oh, and, yeah. and dials. Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, when George was designing a watch, I mean, his, he had a big criticism for the industry that they didn't know how to design watches. And um, he said most people can't even design a correct dial, they look like gasometers. <laughs> so um, his, his key goal was, you know, this is perhaps a difference in, you know, obviously key difference in design approach between Gentra and Daniels. His, his key um, focus on every single watch he made was to design the dial first. Once you can make sure that the dial is legible and with an instance you can tell the time. You don't need to read the time, just with a flash you can tell the time. If you can achieve that then you have a great watch. And so with every single watch, I mean, I've got sketches of half a dozen to a dozen pocket watches where he's just practicing different layouts and combinations of seconds, chapters and up and down and temperature compensation dials and things like that until he worked out the correct balance and feel and weight of the whole dial. It's only at that point that, that you then drill back into the movement behind and start to design the mechanism, mechanism behind to come through to the dial. So certainly the dial led the whole of the construction of the mechanism. And I'm assuming he never used computers to design anything. What, yeah. what about Genta? Did he use computers? Always oh, impossible. Yeah. It's an artist. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah, it's yeah. impossible. Which is beautiful because we're talking about yeah. uh, two men I don't know. in it's a pre-cad world. It's a different, uh, different age. Yeah. Yes, now yeah. you are obliged. Without computer, you cannot make this kind of yeah. uh, piece mm -hmm. of art. So you have to be able to manage uh, the, the technology and the skills uh, in, a, in a correct way. If you are obsessed by computer, often in terms of design, the computerized design could be dangerous because if you are not able to manage it, uh, it's the computer that makes the watch, not you. And uh, it's, it's not so easy. You have to very well know of the softwares because otherwise you are not able to manage the shape on the surfaces at the end, you have an, it's a strange Frankenstein watch. Do you see in the industry today, not talking about specific brands, are they letting computers design their watches for them? Today, without computer, uh, honestly, I cannot imagine to have, uh, to have watches. Okay. With this time to market. Mm -hmm. If I have 10 years, maybe I can make a watch. But if I have to product a watch to make a redesign, to make a re, uh, restyling of a dial, dial is less complicated. You use the computer just for the graphic design, but uh, in terms of uh, surfaces. For cases and for bracelet, first of all, the bracelet is a piece of engineer. Have to work with the buckle, have to fit on your wrist. Uh, the bracelet is most difficult things. When, when you design watches, the bracelet is a nightmare and they have to fit with the case. That's why, for me, Genta is a master, not for the octagonal shape, I come back, but for the link between mm -hmm. the case and the bracelet. The integrated bracelet. The integrated bracelet, mm -hmm. yes. But coming back to for designing computer, so if, if I look now what, what Grossman is doing, if we start really, we start with drawings. So the first design drawings are made by hand for the dial, ah, yeah. for the cases. Yeah, yeah. And after, we try to set also the movement if we start with special constructions. So also technology, yeah, sure. we do everything by hand. And after, you only put it into yeah, yeah, the system. I don't, I don't use computer. I make sketches just by hand. But I have even a team of designers that took my sketch and transform it <laughs> in, <laughs> in, uh, in a beautiful rendering with the 3D surfaces, uh, A classes. It's fantastic. But <laughs> because I need the team, because otherwise if I'm alone, I can make beautiful sketches and after I have to immediately find someone that make a 3D files to make a f prototypes or f the movement, it's, uh, it's the same, but it's, uh, it's a fantastic approach. Back to the floor. Okay. Is this working? Yeah. Okay, we got the, the, the Royal Oak. Um, Omar Piguet chose not to celebrate the 20th anniversary of the Royal Oak because they, the, the Royal Oak of Shore because they had just celebrated the, 
the 40th anniversary of the Royal Oak. So I, uh, I talked to, to, to Emmanuel Gates, and actually he said that Genta went nuts when he saw the Royal Oak offshore. He told him, he made a huge fuss at Basel World and, said, and told him, you killed my watch, you killed my watch. So that's just uh, disclosing uh, uh, Emmanuel Gates' take on the, on the, on the Royal Oak versus, uh, versus General Genta. And now, I don't want to sound iconoclast, but I need to assume the part of the devil's advocates. So, uh, General Genta is regarded as a, as a genius, and he was. Um, but there are, there are few, a few of us, a little bit me included, that think that he milked a little bit the cow too much regarding the integrated design, selling the same overall concept to several companies. Yeah. And we, we had the mention of the Mayan pyramids. It's funny because yesterday there were several of us were having dinner and we were going through Genta's designs. And some of them were, well, the word more used was ugly. So was that, it was, it was experimental. But those, I would also like to know what's the value of those, those, those time pieces in, in auctions. That those complications with the, with the pyramid structure, that, you know, the 80s were not a, a, a good decade for, for watch design and uh, overall. So uh, I would like to, to, to know your take on, on, on that, the, 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 the integrated design plus those designs that less, are less known for the worldwide audience. Uh, I think uh, uh, the pyramid one is not so good because what's so decorative. And when you play with decorative elements, it's the first time that become old. The pure shape is forever. We talk about Royal Oak today, and uh, the pyramid was made with a lot of decorative elements, even the Jeffica, a lot of decorative bolts around the bezel. You say today, and you can immediately recognize uh, the age. It looks like old, because the taste changed during the years. Vintage. It's a vintage piece. But when you talk about pure forms, uh, like the Royal Oak, like a Bulgari Bulgari, like the Nautilus, it's just uh, the different forms that play together, and uh, it's timeless. This is my point. I don't play a lot with applied decorative elements, because it's the first thing that becomes old, because it's a it's matter of style. It's just a style. When we talk about design, we don't talk about style. We talk about a lot of different things. Idea, vision, different way to play with materials. Small innovations, uh, but not decorative elements. If you need decorative elements, it means that your idea is not strong enough, and you need to make maquillage. If your idea is very strong, you don't need to make decorative elements, because it's strong itself. I think if we look at uh, Genta's work and Genta's body, and if we reflect on that as Genta the artist, you know, with all artists, uh, visual artists, um, you have their early career, their mid-career, the mature, you know, yeah. mid-career, mature period, and then, you know, the, the period they have towards uh, 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 the end of their lives. Um, so if we were to look at Genta at the outset, um, he first burst onto the scene in the 50s. He had just graduated. Um, some of the more iconic designs of the 50s um, were really the, uh, uh, the work he did with <coughs> Universal Genève. Um, and if you think about it, the one... That, that was perhaps one of his most successful um, early designs was the pole router, where it was quite minimalist um, and very, very different to the works that he produced right at the end. Um, his, you know, it was quickly followed up with uh, the uh, reinterpretation of the Seamaster, of the Constellation, um, uh, you know, in, in the late 50s. And you know, towards the end of the 60s, uh, where he had already established himself um, and had already started collaborating with AP and uh, with Audemars Piguet, uh, um, you know, he designed, I believe it was 69 or 70, he designed the, 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 the first drawings for the Royal Oak, right, before the launch in 72. He then followed it up with, uh, uh, in 76, with the Nautilus, um, with the engineer, um, and that was, you know, the 70s is, is really his sort of uh, mid-career stage where, you know, he was full of confidence in himself. And he had this vision for 
uh, what I term as the technical, the luxury, the technical luxury performance sports watch, um, and the integrated design, um, which has now fed and uh, uh, inspired many, many others. His later uh, career was really centered on his own house and the house of Genta. And you have to understand that when Genta went independent um, and created his own brand, um, a large part of his work were um, special commissions by members of the royal families of the Middle East, of Southeast Asia. And because of his stature as a designer, he really had carte blanche. And anything he designed, everything he designed um, that you know, was, went into production ended up being sold. Um, so there was tremendous commercial success to balance off these very, very wild um, aesthetics that he, uh, you know, that he created. Um, and I think it is really these watch designs that he produced in the late stage of his career um, that may not have been as commercial because they weren't commercial. Just one of a kind piece. A lot of one of a kind pieces, right? Every single, you know, Mayan pyramid, uh, Grand, so Grand Petit Sonore, every single uh, uh, Usain, the sea urchin uh, 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 case designed with the, the Grand Petit Sonore was sold, right? And you, in the 80s, oh no, sorry, it was the early 90s, um, you know, when you could sell 10 1.1, 1.2 million Swiss franc watches uh, at a single showing in a Basel fair, it's considered pretty successful. Not bad. Not bad at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. And uh, these watches hold value? What's the. Well, let's not talk about that now. <laughs> but it's a, I, you know, I mean, if it was me, I, I would buy one of them today. <laughs> Yes, I, I'm sorry, I got, I got handed the microphone at, uh, at about the same time that uh, Miguel asked his question. My question was actually, it's, it's pretty similar and you guys have more or less answered it. It's always just kind of um, puzzled me looking at Genta's work overall. You know, you look at uh, his early, middle and late stages as, you, as you've been saying, Michael. And you know, it's almost as if uh, he started out uh, like Brancusi and ended up, uh, you know, like, um, I mean, pick a, pick a Baroque painter. You know, his work got more and more innate and more and more Baroque as the years went by. And um, yeah, I guess it's just always, it's always seems strange to me. Like there doesn't you think you think of a designer, and you you try to find some sort of um, unified aesthetic that runs through their work. But you look at uh, his early, middle, and late period, and they look like the, these these watches all look like they were designed by completely different people with completely different uh, priorities and orientations. And uh, yeah, I guess I was you know again you've largely you know answered this as a question, but it's I guess it's now just an observation. I always thought that that was a peculiarity of his work. So um, having known both of these men um, and had the distinct pleasure of meeting with Genta many, many times in Basel when there used to be an escalator right outside the, the little, tiny little booth that he had in answer to your question or your observation, I remember when he introduced all those Disney characters and he was so excited and he was like a kid in a candy store with the hands moving and he he loved that period almost, I think, I think he felt that was such a distinct move forward for him. Um, he felt liberated in the did. his own past. He did. It almost as yeah. was as though, I don't know if that's the case that you know, Michael, but that's, yes. that's what I Absolutely. remember, him really just being so excited about that. Absolutely. Anyway, observation. <laughs> the Disney collection was a great idea, and over years. Yeah. Everybody wanted some Mickey Mouse and Minnie Mouse. That's really fantastic. Um, if I if I may ask, if I can I have a question for Fabrizio? Yeah. Um, we've, we've, from what Michael um, said, we we have this understanding that for him, um, Gentle was more of an artist above all. From your comments, it seems like he's more of a designer. So. Is he more of a designer for you or more of an artist? And, um, and why is that? Now, honestly, I'll tell you that he's a designer with an artistic approach. Because it's, uh, after this discussion, I discovered different, uh, different genta. He, able to sell his ideas very, very well. Uh, often he has a design approach, 
design mind with an artistic approach. And this is very difficult to find because if you are a designer, often say, I'm a designer, I'm not an artist because I play with constraints, I play with the industry. An artist is alone, uh, it is your big piece of marble with your hammer. This is my vision, this is my passion, this is my heart. If you love it, okay. If you don't love it, who cares? It's just for me. But this kind of mix, uh, it's really unique. That's why now I understand that the, you can see so many different gentle approach during his career at the beginning and after he start to remove because all the artists more or less have the same uh, career. At the beginning you make a lot of effort to establish yourself and after you start to remove things from your artistic uh, pieces and after at the end you change completely because you have to be, uh, that's my idea and that's it. I have a lot of clients that love strange things and I have the opportunity to make this kind of watches with the pyramid. So now I change completely my perception even when I, I just talked about decorative elements. Was not decorative elements, it was like the exotic cars. You have the opportunity to make something very strange for one client, for 10 clients. So it changed completely the perception because we receive a lot of requests for one of a kind pieces for sure for Serpenti, for the Octo Collection, and we receive a lot of strange requests. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I want to watch just for me. Yeah. You have to play with this material, you have to play with this shape, and often I say this is, for, for me, it's not good because it doesn't respect the heritage of the brand. I cannot do it. But often, if you are alone, if you can manage your own brand, you can make all what you want. You, have a, you are a designer with an artistic approach. You have a lot of clients who want to wear your amazing, incredible pieces. Uh, you are more, in the last period, you are more an artist than a designer. At the beginning, he was a designer. At the end, he was an artist. A point, exactly. Make a deal. <laughs> Good deal. Uh, my question is uh, to Roger. Um, would uh, George Daniel uh, accept uh, comments or opinions uh, regarding uh, the designs or uh, the mechanism towards the design, or he would do what he thinks is right uh, regardless? No, he's very much, yes, a self contained watchmaker in that respect. And um, no, he, uh, I mean, I remember one challenge. Um, oh, from me, sorry. Oh, sorry, right. Um, in, <laughs> in, the, um, in the early days, no, I probably wouldn't have dared. Um, I remember having a discussion about the Millennium wristwatch and thinking that the positioning of the crown, which is sort of in an unusual position around here and is very small, and I, you know, I just talking about the practicalities of that, and he wouldn't have it, you know. And I, you know, it was his watch, so why should he listen to, as he called me, a young upstart? But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but latterly, he started to, you know, you know, be more open. And I designed the Daniel's anniversary wristwatch, um, sort of for him, and uh, that was accepted. And um, but for me, the big question was. Uh, in that process, in that particular watch, was during the design phase of the anniversary watch, I'd had the idea to create the single wheel coaxial escapement, and I knew there were real benefits to using that, and I, I, I didn't really want to go back to the two individual separate wheels, the upper and the lower wheel, because of the challenges I'd had in making those. So uh, the day came when I had to make this proposal to George, and. Um, he came in, I asked him if he'd call into the workshop, and he did, and I told him what I'd been thinking about, and I'd actually prepared a watch, one of my watches, but with the uh, single wheel coaxial in, and I said that, uh, you know, I really need to put this in your watch. And he looked at it, and, you know, under the microscope, said, fine, it's an improvement. It's a worthwhile improvement, so go ahead. Uh, so that was a big moment, yeah. Here comes the tough question. Get ready, panel. 
Um, I think this could be open to anyone to answer. Um, we've lost, I think, from a watchmaking perspective in design, two of the biggest masters that, unfortunately, I never had the pleasure to meet. If we were to do something different today and moving forward, what is it that we can do to make sure this, the legacy of people like George Daniels and Gerald Genta continues to live on and every other great master that comes after them will be celebrated, not just by talking about designs and, and the, the commercial aspect of those timepieces, but really about the people who were not really recognized for their timepieces and their design when they were alive, only celebrated when they were gone. I think recognize those people, um, yeah. tell their stories. I mean, these two men had, we didn't really talk about it, I mean, you talked about some of it in anecdotes, had amazing personal stories. And I think it's come up a lot in these panels, um, talking in, in various aspects of marketing and, and, and other, other things, but watches people talk about in terms of the technology or they talk about in the terms of the design, but I always think there's this third element, that, which is this magic which is this emotional connection. There are histories and tradition and stories. Who made the watch? Who wore the watch? What was the context, the framework of that? And people are fascinated by that. And I, I, I agree with you, Malik. I don't think that's, those stories are told enough. And I think if you want to endure a legacy, um, that, that's one way, to, to, to more storytelling. But I think uh, if you take George Daniel, with just Robin and uh, myself, we had a discussion before. So I think it's really uh, Sir Roger. He's now going on, and he is, takes the heritage of George Daniel, and he's put it now in the in the new century. And uh, for design, you have the Royal Oaks in 30 years now, and it's still one of the top bestseller in the watch industry, and it will go on. So it's 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 still there. And everybody's handling it and is buying the watches, and uh, you will not forget it. I think the best way to approach that would be to, you know, for everybody just to go to Siddiqui and the Hourglass and yeah. buy their watches. I think this is a, a question for Roger. It seems to me you must have and had quite a weight on your shoulders because we're talking about telling stories, but how hard is it for you that here you've got your own brand, you're making your own watch, and all everyone talks about is George Daniels. <laughs> <laughs> now, that, that's obviously so a benefit, but it must also, at night after a few drinks, do you ever think, God, George Daniels. <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> well, he, he wasn't a bad person, you know, to be talking about, was he? No, I mean, no, not at all. I mean, I'm, I, you know, I'm hu hugely grateful for that opportunity to work with George. And the chances are, I mean, I took my first and second watch to show him. My first watch, he said, go away, it looks awful. Um, <laughs> second watch, which was made five and a half years later, took five and a half years to make, you know, that clinched the job, the... You know, he eventually offered me a job working with him on the Isle of Man, and, you know, that directness, that bluntness, you know, was... Had he told me the first watch was brilliant, you're a great watchmaker, God knows where I'd be now, because it wouldn't have sold. So, no, um, so no I'm always grateful for that. And, yeah, no, it's... it's, it's uh, I'm carrying, you know, in some respects, I'm carrying on with that sort of drive to improve the mechanical timekeeper that he had. And I built on his work, and I think I've done justice to the work. But now I feel, maybe I don't know if Michael could say it, but maybe I'm coming into my own work now. You know, and I've become, you know. So how open would you be to have an external designer? I wouldn't. <laughs> Sorry. No problem. <laughs> He's so busy anyway, but... Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, for, for me, it's, it's a very, very personal thing. And over the years, people have said, why don't you collaborate with such and such? Or, you know, why don't we do, a, you know, work together? And I just, I couldn't do it. It's impossible. You know, my watches are my watches, and... You know, it's all I've ever done for, you know, nearly 30 years now. 
And um, you know, likewise, George, you know, he could never have worked with anyone. He could never have collaborated with, with, with Genta, no matter. I'm sure, as I said, they had mutual respect for each other, but it's such a personal thing. Very much. They had a great uh, respect for um, you know Derek Pratt. They had a close relationship and used to bounce ideas and so on. Um, so yeah, no, definitely. You know, he he could understand other people's work, but he had a focus and he had to achieve everything he did with that. You know, what what Roger isn't saying is the reason why he doesn't talk about himself so much is because his wait list is so long now. <laughs> Right. <laughs> yes. There's not much point in talking about yeah. it. Let's divert the attention yeah. away. Yeah, I shouldn't be here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have time for one more question. So, oh, thank you. Um, I had the, the great opportunity to work with uh, Jared Genta back in 2004 and, and six, and I remember at that time he was painting a lot and I think sculpt, creating sculpture as well. And um, I wonder, you, Michael, you know, you know him better, but I had the feeling at that time he, was, he, he really wanted to be recognized as an artist. And uh, I wonder if you've seen those pieces of art and any chance we would see them auctioned at Christie's one day? Uh, no, because I think the family are holding on to the, 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 those paintings. Um, but he was, you know, he was very exuberant. Um, and I think his, you know, the, the, the sort of final decade of his life, he was very exuberant, the, the colors, you know, I think he was sort of more a, an abstract landscape painter. Uh, he painted figures as well. Um, there were a lot of, I think, royal oak bezels in there, uh, in those the, paintings. Yeah, th there was a moment, yes, absolutely <laughs> right. Um, but I think also, you know, and this goes back to the point earlier about designing by computer, you know, using CAD or, you know, Genta was a classically trained artist. Um, you know, he wouldn't just sketch, he would paint his designs, right? So all his, all his designs were accompanied with, you know, they were watercolor works. Um, so he literally painted everything. Yeah. Right. Yeah. With that, I think, oh, another question, yes. Uh -oh. Oh, no, no. Uh -oh. no, it's okay. Uh -oh. Jack gets to wrap it up. Um, this is a little bit, it's a kind of question for everybody, but a little bit of question uh, more for Michael, I think. Um, uh, Michael, you mentioned a couple of times Pierre-Michel Goulet. And, you know, one of the things I've always kind of, that's kind of amused me about the Swiss watch industry is it, it really forgets its own heroes kind of chronically. And, you know, we, we've been talking about, uh, you know, Gerald Genta and uh, the legacy of George Daniels. And, you know, it, it, does it strike you as weird that um, it's, that, uh, Genta's work, so much of it relied on a collaboration with this brilliant constructor whose name probably 99% of people who consider themselves watch enthusiasts have never heard. Yes. And yet, you know, the work that we talk about would have been impossible without this guy. Does, does it seem strange that it's not celebrated more, more as a, more of a partnership? Um, well, I think, f first of all, you have to look at the, the, the individual. And I think, you know, I, I, I must confess, you know, I, I knew Pierre Michel for a very short period of time. Um, before he left for uh, Frank Muller. Um, and I think, you know, Vartan Marquez at that point in time had offered him uh, an opportunity to create his own brand, which he did. Um, except that I, I don't think, it, you know, it, it met with tremendous success. I think, you know, he is a sort of uh, constructor, engineer, master watchmaker who was more comfortable um, creating for um, others. And so if you look at some of the Frank Miller super, you know, super complications, um, his, you know, his, uh, his signature is all behind that. The cousin, the cousin is the most overshadowed yes. uh, personality. What was the name of the, the cousin? Because we, 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 talk, yeah. we don't talk a lot about Pierre Michel Goulet, but yes. we never talk about the cousin because he was always working with the cousin. Right. Okay. I think in 90 minutes, we've scratched the surface of talking about these two gentlemen. And I encourage all of you to ask questions of our panelists afterwards. But for now, our time is up. I want to thank this ex exceptional panel for your time and openness and sharing. Thank you so much. Thank you, Stacey.